Okay, so let's begin the afternoon session. Uh, I just like to apologize up front because uh, we forgot to record the morning session, so we lost out on all of your wonderful presentations. Uh, I think the <laughs> I just got a seven second video <laughs> from the morning session. Uh, but now I think, so uh, whoever is sitting next to him, just make sure that uh, the recording is on so that uh, we don't go goof up next time. Okay. So let's go ahead with uh, where we left off in the morning session. Um, I think those two hours was really, were really useful. Uh, first from your presentation, so I could know uh, where you stand in terms of uh, your understanding of the overall uh, uh, structural analysis from an aerospace perspective so that I can kind of tailor the rest of the uh, course uh, towards uh, keeping pace with what uh, you already know, right? Now, uh, so what we uh, concluded uh, towards the end of the morning session was uh, to see that need for semi-monocoque constructions. So in other words, uh, we know now uh, not only uh, the answer to the question why shells, but also why beams, right? So, the, because each one of these individual entities, if you look at, you can think of them as beams, which are supported in various complex ways, but uh, nonetheless, they are beams in the sense that they are one-dimensional structures. In other words, you take the cross-sectional geometry, the um, size of that is uh, much smaller compared to the length of each one of them. Therefore, they are essentially one-dimensional structures. Whereas, the uh, what we already had in the monocoque and also continue to have in the semi monocoque is the skin which is a shell because it's a two dimensional structure wherein the thickness is very small compared to the other two dimensions in this case the circumference and the length compared to the circumference and the length the thickness of the uh, skin is very small same thing here compared to the span of the uh, aircraft wing or the tail uh, and also compared to the cord you have the thickness of the skin once again uh, is a small quantity. So, these uh, stiffening structures are all one dimensional in nature and uh, the uh, skin itself is two dimensional in nature and when we say 1D or 2D, uh, we should always keep in the back of our mind that in reality all structures are three dimensional, just that we have the advantage because one dimension is either uh, very large or very small compared to the other two, we take advantage of dropping off the smaller dimensions. If we uh, do this so-called dimensional reduction in an appropriate way. So, uh, how to do it in an appropriate way is beyond the scope of this particular course. So, I will uh, only mention the methodology and uh, we will go with the results of that methodology. But we will also look at some simpler ways of doing it and uh, see that some of those uh, simple derivations lead to special cases of the more generalized state of the art theory that is available today. So, what I will leave you with at the uh, end of the course as a takeaway is something that uh, make you equipped to handle state of the art problems, but at the same time we will not have derived those things, we would have only given those as results, but we will also give derivations for those things which are much simpler and easy to understand, but you will see that Mm, uh, if we drop off a lot of those uh, simplifying assumptions, that is what the state of the art will eventually do. Right? So, uh, now uh, we in the morning session, we already covered what is the cover skin, what is the spar, what is the uh, longitudinal stringer, uh, again the uh, in terms of how the difference is uh, in an aerodynamic surface as opposed to the fuselage and also uh, just more of a nomenclature difference, especially the transverse ribs that are there in the wing and the uh, tail, uh, we call them as uh, frames, rings or if they are uh, covering the entire cross section, we call them as bulkheads, usually you have the uh, aft bulkhead, uh, the rear bulkhead or the, f the forward bulkhead that uh, typically are there on most aircraft. Okay, so uh, as I said, these are uh, nomenclature which are uh, kind of unique to aerospace engineering. So, similarly in naval architecture, you will have uh, some similarities, but some uh, differences as well and pretty much true of all uh, vehicular structures. So, now we will take up each one of these individually and start looking at um, the actual functionalities. Uh, there are main multiple functionalities of each one of these components, but we will focus on some of the major uh, functionalities, especially from a structural point of view. Okay? 
So let's start with the cover skin. So now you see in the cover skin, uh, the first functionality that uh, we will be talking about is that it uh, helps to transmit loads and in particular transmit the aerodynamic loads and uh, in uh, there is of course from the aerodynamics there is the shear as well as the pressure uh, the compared to the shear the uh, pressure obviously dominates and uh, that is going to be causing the larger amount of stresses so if you think of uh, just your own skin and you're in the atmospheric pressure but you go to a higher pressure environment let's say like venus obviously the atmospheric pressure is going to be large and therefore that pressure is going to make certain um, changes in how your skin responds to that essentially in the stresses that it develops will be larger than what it is on the earth right so same thing uh, because the aircraft is stationary on ground it doesn't uh, it faces just the atmospheric pressure but once it is uh, uh, flying you it's flying at a such a speed that the pressures are going to be uh, different of course there's a stagnation pressure uh, which involves the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure and so on and so forth right so this these aerodynamic pressure if it is only on the skin and it's a small aircraft and slow aircraft it's fine but as we saw in the morning class once it becomes faster and uh, or bigger the pressure is going to be large and if the pressure is going to be large uh, the stresses that are going to be developed because of that are going to be large and the skin will fail um, unless and until it is very thick and which is heavy and therefore you have these stiffeners. So we should have a mechanism of how the skin transfers this load to the stiffeners and that's essentially through the joints. So how is the stiffener uh, attached to the joints? So if you look at uh, this particular thing here you see uh, if it were all metallic then you typically have uh, these stringers uh, attached to the uh, skin through rivets, for example, right? Uh, on the other hand, if it was uh, a composite, they could be integrally manufactured. Um, if, if it was uh, not a tapered beam, for example, it could even be extruded to, to look at the simplest case. But in most cases, it is uh, co-cured. Uh, in other words, uh, the curing, uh, which is, has to be done of a composite because a composite when you lay it up it's typically wet because you make it out of what is known as a pre-preg so there's a pre-impregnated uh, fibers in other words the fibers are in a matrix which is still half wet so in other words it's not uh, fully cured and so then you bring it to whatever shape you want and you put it in uh, an oven called autoclave so when you put it in the autoclave it goes through certain temperature and pressure cycles and when it does that it kind of hardens and so no longer it is wet, it is dry and it is hardened and that's essentially what you get and you can do that not necessarily individually for the skin and uh, each of the stringers but once you have decided the geometry you can do this whole thing uh, at once uh, what is known as a co-cured or integrally manufactured uh, kind of a composite. So same thing in the case of the metals is much much more difficult unless as I said you have no taper in the wing and it's a very small wing and you could probably extrude it out so it's the same cross section the same airfoil same thickness same cord throughout the span of the wing then um, in such a simple case which is very rare uh, from an aerodynamic perspective you need uh, taper because uh, you don't want to take material where it's not needed the tips are not going to be loaded much from a lift perspective lift distribution is such that it's much more uh, closer to where it is attached uh, because of the tip vortices that you have which kind of equalize the pressure close to the tip and therefore there is no not much of a differential pressure uh, above and below the wing uh, closer to the tips and therefore the lift distribution is much lesser so is the drag and so forth right now uh, coming to uh, the first functionality it's very clear that the skin can't take it on so it transfers to the stiffeners how it does, does is either through the rivet joint or in the case of the composite which is co-cured through the uh, excess resin that is there between the uh, stringer and the uh, skin which is essentially like an adhesive joint. So when you have glue you know that uh, the way the load is transferred from one uh, component to the other component both of which are attached to each, each other through uh, glue is through shear in the glue essentially and that's precisely how it works here as well. So that's the first function of the um, cover skin that uh, is important transmitting 
the aerodynamic pressure to the stiffeners and those stiffeners include both stringers as well as the spar so not the spar web because that's not directly attached to the uh, skin but to the spar caps so spar caps and the stringers are directly attached to the skin and that's where the air loads are getting transferred then uh, next level of transfer will happen from the spars and stringers to the transfer stiffeners that is the ribs that are there because they are there at a certain frequency as, in a periodic manner and at those locations and also some look sometimes you introduce specifically because there an engine is attached or a landing gear is attached so there are concentrated loads you, the skin can't take it all by itself so you will have a transfer stiffeners at those locations so that's how it works and in the case of the fuselage of course uh, there will be cutouts for windows there will be cutouts for doors etc so at those locations again you will have um, extra frames uh, or rings uh, which are essentially transfer stiffeners once again okay what is the second function of the uh, cover skin it not only has to transmit the aerodynamic load but also it has to transmit uh, resist the torque that is coming where is the torque coming from it as we saw already it's not only lift and drag but also a pitching moment that is there on the uh, wings and that pitching moment is like a torque and that torsion also has to be resisted uh, to a large extent by the cover skin that's what we were talking about in terms of this loop being covered and that's the same loop that we are talking about in loop number one loop number two loop number three each one of them will take a torque t1 t2 t3 so that the sum of that t1 t plus t2 plus t3 if they're all in the same direction the algebraic sum uh, otherwise uh, is something that is the torque that is being applied to it in terms of the uh, uh, pitching moment in terms of let's say the engine uh, weight the C cg of the engine is a little away from um, the aerodynamic center then essentially that is happening with a moment arm so that can cause an additional twist similarly if the engine is either below the wing or above the wing the thrust line will be ha having a distance uh, non zero distance from the uh, mean aerodynamic center so that will cause a torque so there are torques coming from various sources so essentially it's the sum of that uh, that you're looking at uh, of course uh, if the engine is here these outboard uh, regions that is all the way up to the tip will not have uh, the repercussion of that it's only from there to where the wing is attached to the fuselage these locations will have the torque due to the uh, thrust of the engine or the weight of the engine whereas these will only have from the uh, uh, mean uh, from the pitching moment of the uh, airfoil uh, cross sections themselves integrated all the way from the tip to the particular location that we are interested in so that's the second uh, functionality of the cover skin the third uh, and this is again very very important uh, because the predominant load as we know is the aerodynamic load coming from the lift and the drag especially the lift and so uh, those are going to be causing large bending loads and in the case of uh, helicopters which you uh, discussed in the morning session as well the axial loads because of the centrifugal force and uh, both of those um, so this cover skin what it does is it enhances the stiffness uh, from both of these points of view because the most of the stiffness for the uh, bending and the axial load actually comes from the stringers and the uh, spar caps but uh, the skin adds to that okay so in other words if you look at the cross-sectional area if just you're looking at the axial load the axial load is being phased by a certain uh, area finite area which includes uh, the uh, area of cross-section of each one of these uh, stiffeners uh, multiplied by the number of stiffeners if all of them have the same area otherwise of course you have to add them individually and then of course the area of cross-section of the spar caps plus the thickness of the cover skin multiplied by its perimeter so that's the total area that you're going to get uh, which is uh, going to be resisting the axial load but as we saw in the bending it's uh, not the axial load it's it's axial load everywhere but above the neutral axis will be in one sign the up below the neutral axis it will be in another sign in other words one of them will be compression the other will be tension depending upon the direction of the moment whether it's this way or this way that will get interchanged uh, 
So, but nonetheless, it's normal stress once again, and that normal stress, um, a part of it will be taken by the uh, cover skin, uh, most of it being taken by the spark caps and the um, stringers. Okay, so this is as far as the cover skin is concerned. Uh, you have any questions or doubts on the functionality of the cover skin? Okay, let's move on then. Next, we talk about the spars, right? Uh, sorry, uh, the stringers, right? So, stringers, again, whatever I say, most of it, uh, whatever I say for the wing is valid for the fuselage as well because the, uh, uh, the kind of functionality is very, very similar, just that the numbers will change, the actual shape, geometry, the sizing and all will change. But nonetheless, in a qualitative sense, the functionality remains one and the same. Uh, where there is a difference, I'll uh, specifically mention that. So, uh, one more uh, terminology, again, dif differs from um, different um, entities within the industry, like for example, Airbus might use certain names, uh, Boeing might use certain other names, etc. So, another name which is commonly used in the industry for stringers is longerons. So, essentially, once again, it's essentially along the longitudinal direction. So, that's why you call it a longeron. Uh, so, that's another name for it. The, uh, and so, what, whether it is a stringer or longeron, it's the same uh, entity which is uh, called by different names at different, uh, by different people. Uh, sometimes um, within the industry, if they are using both uh, terminology, they make a distinction that the stringers are shorter ones compared to the longerons which are much longer. For example, I was talking to you about window cutouts and door cutouts over here. So, you can see that if uh, there is going to be a window here, obviously this uh, stringer is not going to run through the window, right? So, in other words, it's going to stop where the window starts, again restart where the window ends. So, in other words, it, uh, you have small piecewise continuous uh, kind of um, uh, distribution of that particular stringer. So, then you call that a stringer, whereas uh, when there are no windows, for example, on the floor, uh, let's say this is running all the way from the front of the fuselage to the rear of the fuselage, it's a very long stringer, then you will call it a longeron. Okay? So, just uh, be aware of some of these uh, technicalities, not very important, but mm, just when if you encounter somebody speaking in the industry, uh, for example, when we go on trips, etc., so then you need to uh, be aware of what exactly they are talking about. So, what are the functions? Just like we saw the three functions for the cover skin, three major functions for the cover skin, we look at a few functions for the stringers or longerons. One is of course, just like the last thing that we mentioned over here for the cover skin, it uh, resists the axial and bending loads. So, this becomes the primary function for that. This was a secondary function for the cover skin. That same secondary function for the cover skin becomes a primary function for the longitudinal stringers. So, that is the main thing that they do. right? Uh, whereas here the main thing that they were doing is to transmit that uh, aerodynamic uh, pressure and or shear to the stiffeners. So next uh, you increase the buckling strength of the skin by uh, bringing this. Why does that happen? Um, I do not know if you are familiar with the Euler buckling, buckling uh, formula, you probably have not encountered that right. So anyway. So, um, so there is some uh, phenomena as we discussed in an earlier class in terms of elastic instabilities. So, if there is a column and you try to uh, actually push through it, either because of uh, geometric imperfections, material imperfections or some disturbance coming, this might instead of only getting compressed, it might also suddenly go through a uh, bend, right. So, that is essentially, you would have seen even like a drinking straw for example, uh, you uh, try to press it, suddenly it will form a kink, right? So, something like that, even a garden hose pipe, for example. So, uh, something similar uh, to that is essentially the buckling and the skin being very thin is subject to that. Remember that we are talking about the lift distribution, uh, which is trying to push up the wings, which means the top uh, portion of the wing is under compression, okay, in flight for most uh, phases of flight it is under compression. So, a part of the skin, uh, if the compressive load becomes beyond a certain value, it can buckle. In other words, it will bend, uh, even though the load is compressive, it will bend, right. So, when it bends, what, what actually happens? So, that is where the stringers help, uh, it is a second function of the stringers, uh, 
that they are going to increase the buckling strength. So how, how is this happening? Uh, because of the fact that these stringers are essentially uh, coming uh, here, they are making a periodic uh, appearance over here. So essentially you are reducing the size of the panel as a whole. right? Uh, in fact, uh, the similar kind of function when we get, get, get to transverse frames or ribs also we will see because the length uh, is getting reduced. Okay? So, uh, compressive loads can come not only, of course, the dominant compressive load is from this side, but there can be compressive loads coming from the other side as well, which is why both the dimensions are important. Therefore, the spacing of the stringers as well as the spacing of the transverse ribs becomes critical point in determining the elastic stability or instability of the uh, uh, skin, the cover skin. Right? So that is the second functionality. The third one uh, is in terms of um, uh, when you are going very close to uh, the material failure limits, there is a possibility that there is a crack. Okay? And this cracks usually start very small and may not be uh, dangerous, in fact it is quite innocuous. Uh, may not even be uh, 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 amenable to a visible inspection, what we call as a BVID, barely visible uh, kind of impact damage which could have occurred. So once a crack is there, that is not a problem, but if the crack starts growing, then that is a problem because if it grows beyond a certain size, then it could create an issue. Now what do these longitudinal stringers do? If there is a crack, let us say uh, over here, now that crack starts growing, as soon as it reaches this particular point, it meets a stringer and which is kind of a bridge. It resists the further growth of the uh, crack uh, at that particular point so that the crack either does not grow or grows much slower. So by that time probably the aircraft has landed and some maintenance can take care of that or whatever. So that is the uh, very important point, if the stringers were not there at all, like in a monocoque construction, what would happen if there is a crack? It will start growing uh, continuously and very fast and it could be quite disastrous. But these uh, guys in between are going to kind of um, bridge that and again you will see a something similar in the case of the transverse um, stiffeners as well because they are also going to come in the way of the crack growth. Any questions on the stringers or longerons? Is this clear? Okay, let us uh, move on to the third and most important uh, part of the load carrying members is the spar because the uh, most important because it is a very large, uh, uh, it might not be shown that way in this particular picture, but the spar cap uh, cross sectional area is fairly large and that is going to uh, cause a huge uh, load uh, capability on that. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's find a high pixel. Yeah. So, um, so these spar caps that are there uh, have a very large cross-sectional area compared to the stringers, and that's uh, that, that's the reason why they are one of the most important part of the structural uh, chain over here. They are all sharing, they are all uh, offering uh, the ability to resist the loads, so various types of loads and different types of loads are resisted by different amounts, but uh, by different components, but the spar plays uh, one of the most crucial roles over there and the caps of course uh, does the same thing as whatever we have discussed for the uh, stringers, but in a much uh, better way because each one of them has a much larger area. But the number of stringers is many more compared to the number of spars and therefore in an overall sense uh, the spars as a set and the stringers as a set together might be doing pretty much a uh, similar kind of a job. Uh, of course the spar also involves the spar uh, web which the uh, stringers do not. Right? So same as longerons but with an amplified functionality because of their larger cross sectional area. The uh, next important thing is uh, its uniqueness as a, opposed to the stringer which is the existence of a web which as I said does a function which is very similar to the cover skin in other words it is capable of taking some shear and so what does that shear do? It helps you to resist torsion, it also helps you to resist the shear forces uh, 
which are coming because of the lift. So remember that the lift is acting uh, perpendicular to the velocity direction, which most of the time is parallel to the um, uh, the spar web, or at least uh, at a very small angle to the spar web, uh, because it depends on the velocity direction, of course. But it's most of the time parallel to that, which means that there is a shear which will be taken because of the lift. So remember that in any beam, when there is a vertical force or a horizontal force that is there, uh, or combination of that. Uh, so, the resultant of that could be in any arbitrary direction that is going to have two effects uh, because it is like a cantilever beam uh, which is fixed uh, to the fuselage that is the wing or the tail uh, it could be the either the horizontal or vertical tail now it is fixed now you see that there is a force distribution that force distribution is going to cause two responses from the um, two main responses from the wing and one is uh, because of the force itself there is a shear stress on the cross section that is a smaller effect compared to the bending because of the bending there is going to be an axial stress both tension and compression depending on the direction of the uh, moment. Now the web uh, particularly just like this uh, cover skin will take care of the shear to a large extent shear due to shear force shear force coming from the lift and the drag as well as the shear, com shear stress coming from the torque because the torque is essentially your pitching moment and the moments due to uh, the thrust line of the uh, uh, engine, the weight of the engine etc. etc. right which we already discussed. So that is as far as the spar is concerned finally we come to um, a, a particular element which is very unique. Uh, it is very different from the three that we have already studied the cover skin, the stringers and the spars namely the transverse uh, stiffeners. The transverse stiffeners as you know are given two different names depending upon whether they are in the uh, lifting surfaces in which case they are called ribs. Uh, uh, in the case of the uh, fuselage they are called the uh, frames uh, sometimes as rings and bulkheads as well. The main thing they do is to maintain the shape. Remember that the aerodynamicist has insisted that there is a particular airfoil he or she or the team has chosen for a particular cross section it could change along the lengths but whatever it is at a given cross section it you want to maintain that shape as much as possible uh, only then the uh, lift characteristics the drag characteristics the pitching moment characteristics the relation between them like the lift drag uh, characteristics etc will be maintained to the level that is required for the design. So, if that is the case then uh, you see that because of the presence of the transverse rib which as I said is essentially uh, pretty much a solid uh, sh uh, which is of the uh, which is thin but it is of the shape of that airfoil at that particular point uh, whatever is the interior geometry and essentially through that the stringers will pass through cutouts that are there in that. So, that is the transverse rib at both these ends and that is going to help you the main functionality is to maintain that cross sectional shape because it is so rigid. So, that uh, at that particular point if the skin tries to bend it is not allowed by the internal transverse rib that is there same thing uh, in the case of the fuselage as well just like in the lifting surfaces. What is the second function here very similar to the uh, function that we talked about over there where there are concentrated forces obviously they are going to cause um, certain singularities stress concentrations as well. So, to avoid that you have these frames at those locations for example, where as I said already where the engine is attached or landing gear is attached there also you would want the transverse frames. So, that uh, the uh, diffusion uh, from the skin into the stringers etc to the spar etc will be a uh, spar cap in particular will be much more smooth that is what the uh, transverse frame or ribs do. Okay, uh, the last thing is of course uh, uh, I think I combined it in the second one which is essentially talking about structural discontinuities. So, just like an engine being attached or landing gear being attached it could also be that uh, at a particular point you want to change the sweep. So, till a particular point you want to have it a 0 sweep and let us say here you want to have a sweep forward. Uh, 
So it all depends upon the aerodynamic design that is there. So at this particular point, it's a changeover from zero sweep to a sweep forward. So there's a structural discontinuity that is happening. Or as we discussed earlier, the two different airfoil configurations uh, and they're blending into each other at a particular location. So these are all structural discontinuities where there can be very different stresses on either side. And in order for that to be redistributed in a smoother fashion, if you put a, um, a transverse uh, stiffener over there, uh, which is a rib in the case of the uh, lifting surfaces, then you can redistribute those stresses uh, in a much more smoother fashion and avoid uh, singularities and failure. So with this, I think we complete this. Uh, any questions on all of these components and how they uh, work together as a team? Okay. It's gone then. Oh, sorry. I have one more uh, functionality from the transverse frame, which is to increase very similar to uh, what we mentioned over here. Uh, so j this is buckling in one direction. This is buckling in the other direction. In fact, this is much more important because you're reducing the effective length of the buckle. And uh, so by placing string transverse ribs at appropriate distances from each other along the span of the wing, or the length of the fuselage, you are uh, increasing the value of the load, compressive load at which buckling can happen and that's uh, increasing the strength. But um, in many cases, you will actually have um, buckling allowed. So in other words, many of the aircraft, even passenger aircraft for that matter, will be operating in the post buckling regime. Okay. So uh, because buckling by itself is not a uh, major failure it is more of an instability that is occurring and that instability sometimes we want to live with just for the efficiency in terms of the weight reduction as long as it's not overly causing any changes in the aerodynamics of the uh, wing because these buckles will be so small the overall deflection that is there in the post buckling regime if it's operating just above the buckling load that it may not uh, be uh, changing the aerodynamics too much. So if that is the case, then you typically uh, design for the post buckling regime uh, operation of the skin, which means that the skin can no longer take compressive loads. So all of the compressive loads, remember, was divided between these three entities, the stringer, the spar cap and the skin. But once the skin buckles, at least in a particular location, that part of the skin can no longer uh, take your uh, compressive loads. So that, uh, and in any case, the bottom is always under tension in the, uh, when it's cruising, for example, it's only the top which is under compression. And within that top, di uh, different locations may be under different levels of compression because they are at different distance from the neutral axis. So it will be maximum over here, it will be minimum over here because it's on the neutral axis, let us say, a po point over here. So uh, there might be certain regions which where the compressive stress is so large that it might buckle in spite of putting your transverse ribs close enough. Because if you put it too close enough, then you'll have too many transverse ribs. The weight due to the transverse rib will enhance the structural weight of the wing and therefore the overall weight of the aircraft. So you wouldn't want to do that. So you're like, there's always a trade-off that goes on in terms of deciding the number of transverse ribs, the spacing of the transverse ribs, etc. But this is something that you should be aware of that we are willing to live with uh, a few of the, a small portion of the uh, top portion of the uh, wing actually buckling and still which means that that compressive load which was shared by the skin along with the stringers and the spar cap will now have to be taken only by the stringers and the spar cap. The skin will not be contributing to taking those compressive loads. So your stringer and spar cap has to be designed in such a way that they are slightly larger in area so that they will take care of that. And many designs that turns out to be a more efficient design in terms of the overall weight reduction compared to having a thick skin because the thick skin is over a larger area and so the weight penalty will be much more because of that. So it's all, um, you can't say for sure this is what will happen but uh, each case by case you will have to look at the advantages or disadvantages of doing that but in many um, flying aircraft today uh, you do have uh, the, the post buckling regime operation.
the last thing that um, is based on one of the loads that we mentioned the last load in the classification that we had the internal pressurization so we said that the cabin has to be pressurized so that the pressure is at a comfortable level neither sea level nor at the cruise altitude but somewhere in between so that uh, it's good for the people good for the avionics etc so which means there is as i said uh, we derived that uh, in the last class we saw there's something called the hoop stress which is fairly large and so uh, the skin is essentially going to be taking that hoop stress for, it's not with the fuselage uh, fuselage i mean the wing also sometimes depends on the uh, fuel tanks so you could have fuel uh, tank bladders which are kind of pressurized fuel sometimes so which means that there can be a little bit of pressure coming from that but more often than not it's a, it's a concern over here in the fuselage because of the internal pressurization there is a hoop stress which is a circumferential normal stress similarly there's a longitudinal stress also now as far as the circumferential uh, stress is concerned uh, that hoop stress is uh, to a large extent alleviated by the presence of a uh, bulkhead or uh, a frame or a ring which is a transverse stiffener over here okay so we go to assignment number three due next week and um, here we are going a step further from what you did in your second assignment and here we are trying to see uh, in terms of the geometry because a uh, whole of uh, morning session as well as afternoon session we've been discussing what are the geometry choices right so now we want to focus on that geometry and look at some practical uh, examples so you i want you to essentially search all kinds of resources that you have access to uh, for, with your vpn i'm uh, sure you should be able to access Jane's All the World's Aircraft, the latest issues and um, again as I said it comes in uh, different uh, categories of aircraft and uh, also as you've already been using the large language models uh, you can try to uh, see what best you can get in terms of information make sure it's reliable enough uh, double check it and then uh, eventually I want you to as a team work on this that find at least five examples each of the three categories that we discussed in the morning namely the truss like aircraft like uh, let's say the Wright brothers kind of an aircraft uh, they, and uh, they, there are, even though uh, it was dominating in the first two decades there have been for sports purposes people building even in uh, more recent times these kinds of aircraft uh, truss like configuration because if it's for small speeds and just one or two uh, people on it and for recreational purpose then uh, that might serve the purpose so um, yeah, instead of uh, necessarily going to the older aircraft if you can find some newer aircraft for each then uh, that will make sense because we can see the trends in terms of the industry where it is going that will be more uh, useful for you uh, rather than just a pure historical perspective which you can find uh, probably more easily but I, I want you to spend a little more time to see um, if you can find newer aircraft for each of these categories then the monocoque uh, which as I said will usually be typically smaller aircraft uh, slower aircraft uh, where just the shell alone is there no stiffeners then finally the one which is most common you find it uh, almost uh, everywhere omnipresent uh, uh, almost which is semi monocoque and that's a uh, wing construction for military aircraft as well as uh, passenger aircraft so i'm not restricting you to any particular kind of aircraft feel free whatever you can get a uh, reasonable amount of information for uh, uh, here is where i think the magazine called flight flight international uh, it gives you a lot of cutouts and things like that uh, of different aircraft the, you might get a feel for uh, these geometries especially the semi monocoque uh, skeletal construction uh, it will really help to you for you to understand the cover skin the uh, spar caps the spar webs and the uh, transverse ribs etc that we've been talking about uh, we will uh, go through some of those cutouts uh, probably in the uh, yeah maybe i can probably cover it today let's see uh, so then uh, we can see how uh, each one of them uh, in terms of a specific particular application how it is different uh, as opposed to the generic claims that we have been making for each of these category of components now what i really want is this is something that is very difficult to get but uh, you can see uh, where you can try to get it which is essentially the uh, 
thickness of the skin that is essentially your cover skin that is there either in the fuselage and or the uh, lifting surfaces you have the skin thickness and if you plot that skin thickness versus the wingspan which is a kind of a measure of how large is the aircraft right so larger the aircraft of course it's not always true because the aspect ratio comes into picture there are some high aspect ratio aircraft which might have a large span even though overall the size of the aircraft might be small but uh, just to keep uh, things uh, to kind of track down things we want to see if you plot versus wing span the skin thickness what happens uh, i mean uh, logically you would think that uh, as the wing span becomes large the aircraft becomes large if it's the same type of aircraft and therefore the loads are going to be large and therefore the skin thickness has to be larger that's true uh, when you go for the monocoque kind of construction but you will see that once you introduce the reinforcements that need not be the case so that's the re thing that i want you to bring so all these things you will be for uh, because you're going to have five truss like five monocoque and five uh, semi monocoque you're going to have 15 i want all 15 on the same plot okay so that you can compare across them uh, and see which is more which is small are there certain clusters which are getting formed uh, so can you say something about those clusters why is it getting clustered at a particular location etc Yeah, exactly. Per aircraft, yeah. Okay. Similarly, another uh, plot that I would like you to go to is instead of geometry, you're looking at the weight now, right? So, uh, just like wingspan is one way of measuring the size of an aircraft, the weight of the uh, maximum takeoff weight is what I mean by gross weight over here. The maximum ta uh, takeoff weight of the uh, aircraft. Uh, that's um, again a measure of how big an aircraft it is or how, la how much uh, payload it can take or um, how much fuel it can take for a larger range etc. So that's a measure of that. So once again I want you to plot the skin thickness because this is a very very important parameter that we are going to be dealing with as far as structures uh, geometry is concerned. Once is, one is of course in terms of the uh, category of aircraft and which is most mo more often than not semi monocoque but within semi monocoque it's not only the designing of the spars, the stringers and the transverse ribs, but also the skin thickness is a very, very, plays a very crucial role because that then decides the uh, number of stringers you need to have, number of spars you need to have, what is their geometry, etc. So that's why uh, the, uh, the stress on the, these two quantities, this, the skin thickness versus uh, wingspan and gross weight that uh, I want you to plot. I already mentioned this, uh, I want you to comment on uh, if the uh, points for those 15 aircraft, out of those 15 let's say 3 or 4 are coming very close to each other, it's what I call a cluster, uh, they're coming close to each other, so can you say something about that, why is that uh, perhaps happening, okay. Uh, more, more of these are speculation, uh, you may or may not be right, but at least we are trying to draw inferences from the data that we have to see uh, if we are thinking aloud, can we make certain um, inferences from whatever our study uh, is. Then um, as far as the uh, references are concerned, I want you to upload to the files in our uh, team so that uh, we can then cross verify and check, see what, what exactly are we talking about, where you got the source of the particular information from. Not the entire documents, so it might be large uh, sized files, just whatever you are extracting. Uh, with an appropriate citation for that. Uh, uh, as I said, the skin thickness is very, very difficult to get. So you have to do a lot of searching, researching, beg, borrow, but don't steal. The reason uh, I'm mentioning this is sometimes in the past we have had students who have uh, probably been employees of aircraft companies or something. You take their proprietary information, you can get into trouble. So uh, all that we are dealing with here is open source information from various different sources. I just want you to make sure that uh, uh, that's the kind of data that we are dealing with. Okay. Now, yeah, so as I uh, promised, um, here we look at a few cutway cutaways, uh, most of them taken from Flight International, but also some textbooks. Um, and in particular, something that uh, still may not be very clear for you, the transverse members, the ribs, and or the bulkheads, etc. So those will become a little more clearer uh, once we get into these uh, cutaways and uh, some of the things we have been mentioning in a more uh, 
generic manner we will try to um, see if we can pinpoint and say okay this is a military aircraft this is flying fast this is flying slow this is taking more people uh, therefore th this is the design decision that has been done there can we uh, draw, draw a few qualitative conclusions is what we will try to see and once we are able to do that we will look at some more classification of these components uh, more or less we have done it in the previous slide but we will take it see if we can take it a little further okay so these are the transverse uh, members that we're talking about so which you can see it much more clearly here now for the fuselage so here's uh, uh, probably in a, let's say like in a cargo uh, aircraft where you're loading the cargo into the aircraft and removing it so you want a very large door over there so when you have uh, something like that you want to uh, have the edges of that covered by fairly thick configuration so if you look at the uh, cross section of this transverse rib over here as well as here compared to this you would see that this is much larger cross section this is also much larger cross section whereas this is th a much smaller cross section because here you are having a large cutout and there is a uh, possibility of additional loads coming in and therefore you would want to take care of that uh, so that's as far as the fuselage is concerned an example of the fuselage here is an example of a lifting surface instead of a wing which we have been talking about more frequently now we talk of a horizontal tail uh, so in the aircraft itself uh, the dark shaded region is what we are blowing up over here so the dark shaded region of course is the uh, close to the leading edge of the horizontal tail which is a T tail over here so you see that the uh, horizontal tail is mounted over the vertical tail or stabilizer and then uh, here once again you see these kinds of uh, configurations with holes over here so these are the transverse stiffeners that you're seeing over here those transverse stiffeners are in the shape of an airfoil because they want to maintain the overall shape of the horizontal tail so that's why you see these uh, transverse ribs over there right uh, so similarly again uh, we also mentioned that uh, because you might want to reduce the weight one otherwise also to probably run through the controls uh, levers etc even if it's fly by wire uh, running through the wires for the electric signal etc so these holes serve for that because remember this is the horizontal tail so the elevator is attached to that so you want to deflect the elevator up or down to change the speed of the aircraft or the uh, attitude of the aircraft in order to uh, change the uh, altitude uh, overall of the aircraft so combinations thereof so when you want to do that uh, you typically have to uh, use the pitch stick of course the pilot will be pushing it forward or uh, pulling it backward and uh, when he or she does that that uh, deflection has to happen through a series of control uh, pathways and that pathway depending upon whether it is servo or uh, it is uh, in which case it's hydraulic and or pneumatic or it could be uh, like in more modern aircraft fly by wire kind of systems in which case uh, those wires and control levers etc should be running through those uh, some of those holes of course it serves both ways because any case uh, those locations would not have taken much of the load and therefore uh, having a cutout from a structural point of view is not very damaging but at the same time it's allowing uh, subsystems to operate uh, through the uh, ribs which would have otherwise blocked the way okay so once again coming to the nomenclature i think this i have already mentioned uh, in the fuselage these transverse stiffeners are called either as uh, frames or rings uh, if they are partial and uh, if they cover the entire cross section or at least most of the cross section then uh, we call them as bulkheads and you typically have at least two bulkheads so the front and the rear and in terms of the functionalities, uh, uh, pretty much it's valid whatever we said in the previous slide. On the other hand, uh, instead of frame, ring or bulkhead, in the case of the wing or the tail, any lifting surface for that matter, it could be even a canard in the front uh, ahead of the wing. Uh, in all those th cases, uh, these transverse stiffeners are called as ribs. Yeah. So you see 
this particular thing over here this one that is the uh, so it's having a shape of an airfoil pretty much so the skin is going to come over that that's not shown over here so it's stripped of the skin and you're showing the interior and here you see a lever over there the control system and this is the elevator part of the elevator so you're essentially trying to deflect that so this is uh, coming along the span of the horizontal tail similar thing you'll have in the case of the wing and the vertical tail as well so what it is doing as we said already is to maintain the airfoil shape so it does airfoil shape doesn't distort too much because of the uh, pressure and the shear etc that is acting on it and uh, at the same time it's transferring loads and or if something is connected over there it can take and dis redistribute concentrated loads Uh, so these are examples of longitudinal stringers. This one, this one over here, what is running over there? Yeah. So uh, very easy to remember. Longitudinal, the word long is there. So along the longer direction, which is usually the span rather than the chord, whatever runs along the length and is therefore long is essentially your longeron or uh, stringer or whatever you call that, right? On the other hand, uh, so that's the longitudinal direction. Perpendicular to the longitudinal direction, perpendicular to the span is the chord direction. So anything which is along the chord is essentially your uh, transverse uh, stiffener or rib. Yeah. And the same thing holds in the case of the uh, fuselage as well. So this is an example of a transverse stiffener because this is the length of the, uh, this is along the length of the fuselage. So these are all stringers, okay? They are running along the length. And uh, as I said, sometimes uh, very uh, uh, not so important distinction is made between a longeron, which runs all the way through the length, and a stringer, which can be cut because of the door or because of a window or whatever. So it's not as long as the string, uh, longeron, okay? So, uh, so it's it's a, it's a parallel in terms of the functionality as well as uh, the overall behavior. The only uh, primary difference is coming from the overall shape. In one case, it's an aerodynamically shaped airfoil shape. The other in case, it could be circular or uh, somewhat circular, essentially uh, smoothened out kind of a rectangular shape as you see in this particular case. Are there any other questions on this? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so now uh, we have an example of uh, a British Aerospace 146 uh, for which Airbus manufactures the uh, ribs. So here it might be a little more clearer because the, it's taken out of the cutout uh, or rather it's yet to be put in the wing because it's in the process of manufacturing. So here you have uh, this particular structure that you see on the table that uh, uh, entire thing on the table is a transverse rib. Okay, so it will go at uh, some different locations along the uh, uh, the aircraft's wings and or the fuselage, right? So this is of course the ribs. Those are uh, on the right, you see all ribs. And on the left, you see uh, similar transverse stiffeners, which are rings or frames, which are, uh, as you see, pretty much circular. And uh, you see they are on either side of the window, if you see over here. So that's essentially making sure that they are not cutting through the window. So you have to um, have a certain spacing in terms of the pitch that you have, as we call the distance between two adjacent uh, uh, frames. But they may not be a constant pitch throughout the length. It all depends upon the requirements and also then uh, the special uh, reasons for cutouts like windows and or doors okay now uh, certain things to notice in this uh, which you'll, you'll also notice as part of your homework is um, of course uh, which uh, company makes it but more importantly uh, this particular aircraft the BAE 146 the British Aerospace is having a fairly large altitude at which it cruises right uh, and it's a passenger aircraft though it, therefore uh, from a certification point of view as well as the passenger comfort point of view it has to be pressurized internally pressurized which means there will be hoop stress and longitudinal stress uh, 
poop stress being more dominating because it's almost double the longitudinal stress. And therefore, uh, you typically go for uh, cross section like in this particular case, a circular uh, cross section in order to reduce the stress. Uh, but there might be other reasons because of which you do not go for uh, a circular cross section and in which case you have to account for those uh, regions where the curvature is a little more like what we saw in the um, previous slide for example this is not exactly a circular uh, fuselage cross section it's almost like a square but with the edges which are rounded off so in other words those are highly curved uh, kind of corners that are there so the uh, stress analysis there needs to be done in a very very rigorous way, way to make sure that they are able to handle that right okay so so far any questions okay let's move on okay uh, to give another category of uh, uh, example so here is a cutaway uh, for the twin otter which is an aircraft uh, made by a canadian company called de havilland and uh, here uh, unlike in the previous slide it is much smaller and it's lighter so it takes uh, it's also passenger aircraft like the previous one british, british aerospace 146 uh, this one is also passenger aircraft just takes lesser number of passengers so therefore it's smaller and lighter and um, so you see that the configuration is relatively simpler it's it, when you say simple it, it, this also looks quite complex but compared to that it's a little simpler because of the fact that its size is small and uh, it's a fairly light aircraft and therefore the stress levels are much lesser and uh, therefore you can uh, afford to go for a design like this but even here you see how uh, frequently uh, spaced these transverse ribs are how close uh, to each other uh, because of this particular uh, way of designing you want to keep the shape of the um, wing uh, cross section uh, clo as close to the airfoil chosen as possible right so now it's a simple configuration but you see uh, compared to uh, more uh, larger or faster aircraft uh, which will require more number of spars here you can do with just two spars so you have just two spars that are running through the length as we said spar has two parts to it one is the spar cap the spar uh, web and you see the spar web is essentially vertical that's along the thickness of the uh, airfoil so this uh, thing that you see is part of the overall spar and it is uh, having uh, shear load as its main uh, load carrying capability that is built in so recollect all the functions of all of these uh, entities that we discussed spars ribs stringers and skin and you would see a practical example of how uh, each of them are being dealt with right uh, so in this case of course the landing gears are not on the uh, wing but they are on the fuselage so you have a nose landing gear and you have these uh, two landing gears on the body of the uh, aircraft and you see that those are going to bring in concentrated loads so where they are attached whether it is the uh, nose landing gear or the other landing gears you will see the where they are attached you will have additional reinforcements in terms of the uh, bulkheads and or uh, much uh, larger cross section uh, frames uh, that are needed in order to disperse the load in a much more uh, smoother fashion okay then uh, the other uh, important thing in this particular case as opposed to the british aerospace 146 we saw in the previous slide is that it is flying at a much lower altitude which means that yes the pressure is small compared to the uh, sea level but it's not necessary to pressurize the cabin uh, because the FAA doesn't require that neither does uh, the passenger comfort it's the only a small sacrifice that is done uh, so therefore um, you know internal pressurization which means that instead of the circular cross section we saw in the previous slide here you can go with just a rectangular cross section and those curved uh, uh, corners will not have too much of stress concentration that is building up you will be able to handle it without having to uh, include much larger amount of material chunks over there okay so what is the advantage of course from a rectangular instead of a circular is that in a circular you would have seen in many aircraft when you go close to the window seat 
uh, if you are very tall you might hit the uh, ceiling right so because it's essentially uh, uh, curving downwards whereas if it's a rectangular kind of a configuration like this which um, uh, is used typically for uh, aircraft which are taking very few people for example you want reasonable amount of comfort over there in terms of the height etc and therefore uh, you give uh, maximize the room inside rather than uh, from a structural point of view from a pure structural point of view as long as it is pressurized circular is always the best but if you are able to ha have a uh, appropriate solution in terms of the material and or geometry distribution then you will uh, make sure that you can take any other uh, choice which might be uh, favorable from a uh, different perspective non non structural perspective like this to maximize the room inside okay now uh, enough of passenger aircraft let's look at military aircraft We're taking an example of a harrier over here and um, so what are the um, nuances over here from a uh, user perspective in terms of the overall um, uh, requirements so you have the fuselage which is including the engine and the fuel tanks over here so whereas in most of the aircraft that we saw before uh, the fuel tanks would be in the wing here it is in the fuselage so fuselage is uh, and also the uh, there the engines would be mounted on the uh, wing whereas here the engines are mounted um, uh, in the fuselage right in or on the fuselage so in this case you see that the engine is included not only the engine but also the fuel tanks because this is remember a delta wing the very small aspect ratio therefore the room inside the wing is not sufficient to take as much fuel as this aircraft guzzles right so what you need to do is to and also of course on the uh, wings uh, you have mounted the ammunition okay because it's a aircraft which uh, needs to uh, deploy those ammunition so most of that is essentially attached to the uh, wings as you see over there right so and this is also uh, uh, what is known as a v stall uh, which you'll be familiar with vertical and short either vertical or short takeoff and landing uh, kind of an aircraft and it's also an attack aircraft a fighter so uh because of that the maneuvers that it does uh, will be uh, such that the vn diagram that we saw where we plotted the true air speed versus the load factor the flight envelope is another name for it uh, so that will be much larger so in other words it has to go through larger load factors both positive and negative and at the same time the maximum speeds it goes through are also uh, very large because it's um uh, on the higher side of the supersonic so you essentially you have to make sure that um, the true air speed uh, limits are there and therefore the structure is also designed towards that so uh, which means that you will have many more spars many more ribs and many more skin that's what you see in this fairly complex uh, geometry that you see over here uh, in the cutout okay so now if you look at the ribs that are there at the uh, different uh, distances from the fuselage you will see that the rib geometries are changing quite a bit going from the uh, root of the wing all the way to the tip and that's quite easy to see because there's a huge taper that is there um, it's a highly swept wing pretty much a delta wing that you're looking at and uh, the kind of uh, aerodynamic loads are going to be very very different there's going to be a wave drag as well so you have to account for all of those things in terms of um, the structural design and you uh, which is why uh, a single rib design will not be sufficient for the entire span of the wing you will have to have different ones going from the root to the tip um, okay so then uh, coming to this yeah so despite the complexity in terms of the what each one of these things do what does the rib do what does the skin do what does the transverse uh, sorry the uh, longitudinal stringers do or the spar do uh, they are all pretty much the same qualitatively speaking just that the numbers vary it's much more taxing out here and that's why you have more number of guys to share the load right more number of components over there so concentrated loads also again coming from the landing gear and the armaments of course uh, it is concentrated load in the previous examples also but because of the uh, 
small overall size of the aircraft and within that size so much of complexity is there so uh, the concentrated loads uh, do not have a large distance to disperse themselves off so which means that uh, wherever they are attached the kind of um, leeway that we make in terms of the transfer stiffeners etc it has to be in this case the bulkheads so you, it has to be uh, good enough strong enough uh, and the geometry has to be large enough in order to allow for that okay so this is from pilot press anything need to know over here yeah Oh, it's in the, I'm uh, not exactly sure, but usually I think it will be in the belly of the uh, fuselage in this particular case, but I need to cross verify. But it's, it's in the fuselage, but exactly where in the fuselage, I'm not really sure. It could, for example, be in the tail boom also. So you have partly there and partly here uh, in the belly and or the, uh, in the boom that you have for the tail. Uh, the uh, whole idea is that the wing is too small to accommodate the fuel tanks unlike in the previous examples so you have to move it to the fuselage anything else okay. yeah so this is something very interesting if you look at the history in terms of uh, how structures have evolved uh, especially in the recent past but also over a period of time um, the demand from us the structural engineers or structural designers to be more specific is much more today than it was in the past because the allowance that we get in terms of how much of the overall weight of the aircraft we can utilize for the structure uh, because the rest of course has to go to the payload the fuselage um, sorry the, the payload the fuel uh, the um, the other things like the control systems avionics etc so keeping all that aside how much of the overall uh, weight of the aircraft what percentage can we utilize for uh, the structure that has actually come down over time and luckily we have of course been innovating in terms of the geometries like all that we have see, seen both in the morning as well as in the afternoon classes today and more importantly the materials as well going from aluminium alloys to composites etc with greater strength to uh, density ratio greater stiffness to density ratio so what we call as the specific strength and specific stiffness uh, so there are more better performing uh, materials better performing geometries that we have arrived at and as a combination therefore we can offer a much much uh, superior solution today as opposed to in the past so just to get a feel for those numbers in terms of wing loading so wing loading as you know is a very important uh, parameter in uh, the overall design of an uh, aircraft which is essentially the uh, gross uh, takeoff weight the maximum takeoff weight of the aircraft divided by the uh, wing area the platform area of the wing so that is what we call as the wing loading so it's in uh, usually expressed in newton per meter squared okay uh, the weight remember is a force so it's the mass times the acceleration due to gravity so it's essentially a force in uh, si unit is newton and then the area the platform area of the wing is essentially uh, in meter squared so essentially you're talking of a newton per meter squared kind of a uh, quantity which is wing loading which is a very very critical uh, factor in the overall design uh, of the aircraft in terms of its shaping and sizing uh, not just the structural design but the overall design so that has uh, very interestingly gone up as much as 13 times over a period of time okay uh, compared to earlier aircraft we'll come to the dates shortly on the other hand as far as the structural weight fraction is concerned how much of that weight is allowed to be used for just this structure remember by structure we mean all those th uh, things that we've been talking about the cover skin the transverse ribs the tra the rings the uh, bulkheads the stringers the spar caps the spar um, webs etc all of them put together including of course the rivets to join them or the adhesive to join them depending upon the kind of joints that are involved in spite of all of that if you add that up earlier uh, aircraft as much as 30 to 40 percent of the overall aircraft weight uh, 
was allowed for the structure but today only about 22 to 25 percent is allowed in fact uh, even this number is about a decade old so it might be even uh, lesser today okay so the material and uh, the structural design has therefore evolved both in terms of the choice of materials that we have with more and more high performing composites the in terms especially of the fiber but also the matrix to hold it and then of course the you know, overall structural design which includes the geometry over which we have been spending so much time today yes please I see. Okay, that's correct. So uh, four o four to five, we have that. So you can bring it at three forty-five or so. I'll uh, finish the class. Uh, you have set it up outside, is it? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we start that meeting at four o'clock. So if we can, you three forty-five, you can. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. so the material and the uh, structural design so there has been a evolution so to speak it's not just a, uh, an incremental improvement but a um, whole a paradigm shift in terms of uh, how things have uh, evolved okay so just to put it in a, a perspective over here you are essentially talking about the structural weight percentage in 1917 uh, compared to 2016 that's over a century so it's a fairly long period of time but compared to the history of uh, aviation it's not fairly, uh, that long actually it's pretty much the entire history of aviation we are taking 10 years after uh, sorry about 14 years after the first flight uh, all the way up to just about 8 years back we are looking at what what exactly has been the change you see that the wing loading has gone up so tremendously almost 13 times that it has gone up but on the other hand the structural weight percentage that we are given has come down from about 40% to all the way above, up to about just a quarter of the weight uh, the rest three quarters uh, is the fuel the um, the uh, crew and the um, avionics and other uh, things the, uh, that uh, need to be taken on the aircraft okay are there any questions on this okay so it's it's a question of uh, understanding the challenges that we have uh, come across and the solutions that we have both from the geometry and the uh, material point of view okay uh, continuing with uh, the load based component classification that we have done uh, before uh, we want to take again a few more uh, cutouts as examples to understand the overall geometry so here is the uh, so it's not just in the main portion of the fuselage the mid fuselage but also in the end portions there's a lot of complexity because of the changing cross sectional dimension so you start with a larger uh, cross sectional dimension and you uh, come down to a smaller dimension so which means that you have a conical kind of a structure so what we typically call as the fuselage nose cone and um, so again without the skin you're just looking at uh, the rings that you see over here and then the uh, stringers that you see over here and uh, some location you want the window or whatever so you have these uh, cutouts that you have and where the cutouts are there you can see this uh, particular uh, ring is of a larger cross section compared to the other rings that you have uh, so sometimes you might just call this a frame uh, as opposed to a ring and uh, something like this you might call as a bulkhead which is essentially covering the entire cross section smaller bit okay so now uh, we want to get it get into um, get dirty our hands into uh, the analysis itself because this whole course is about structural analysis so whatever we have done so far is set kind of a preamble to that so to know the kind of animal that we are dealing with so we are well prepared to deal with it now we want to see exactly what we are doing as far as the analysis is concerned from an analysis point of view a structural analysis point of view we are not going to be looking at in terms of the specific nomenclature from what it is coming let's say it's a aerodynamic or uh, propulsive or whatever whatever may be the source we end up with certain resultants and those resultants for which we end up designing the overall structure and the first thing that we have to deal with is 
is the so-called axial forces. As I have been repeatedly uh, mentioning, this example of the helicopter rotor blade centrifugal force is a classic example of a large axial force. But uh, the axial force in that case is tensile, need not always be tensile, some places it can be compressive kind of loading as well. So if it is um, tensile, then we call it a bar uh, if it is, or a rod for that matter. And if it is uh, compressive, we call it a column. But we want to deal with uh, all of them in a generic sense. Therefore, we will just call it a 1D structure. And in fact, we will call the, all of these things as beams as you shall see shortly. But right now, it's only axial load we are talking about. It could be positive or negative load, tension or compression that is, where we call it as a bar or rod on the one hand, tensile, and column if it's compressive. But uh, nonetheless, it's one dimensional in the sense that the cross-sectional dimension is very small compared to the overall length. Next uh, kind of load is the torque. Okay, so. Uh, the axial force example we gave is the centrifugal force for a rotor blade. For the torque, it's the pitching moment in the case of uh, both the helicopter rotor blade as well as the fixed wing. And um, also it could be a drive shaft uh, running from the engine to something that it rotates. For example, in a helicopter, it could be uh, the um, main rotor gearbox or the tail rotor gearbox from which the drive shafts will be running to the hubs of the main rotor and or tail rotor respectively. So those are essentially shafts, uh, more often they are not circular but not necessarily. So that is again uh, a longish structure, in other words cross sectional dimensions are small compared to the length and therefore again we call it 1D. right? So all that matters for us is whether it is 1D or 2D, that is what we are just trying to put them together so that we can treat all the 1Ds together we can treat the 2Ds together and we can just have two theories and then uh, interconnect them because these are not uh, acting separately in a semi monocoque construction you have the skin which is 2D and you have all of these other entities which are 1D and therefore you are uh, you need to have transfer of loads between them. Okay. The third thing again very important is the bending moment coming from predominantly the lift and the drag uh, so which makes the entity called beam okay but as i said we will be using the common term beam to refer to all three of these rather than uh, just the one with the bending moment alone but most of the literature you will see that uh, they have dealt with each one of them separately separate chapters for them even separate books for them etc but um, uh, the current state of the art is such that uh, you can deal with all of them simultaneously and which is how in fact it occurs in reality and especially when it is non-linear it is better you do it that way because otherwise it does not make sense you cannot put them back together later on uh, as an afterthought. So finally you have the 2D kind of structures as well the cover skin in particular and also the, uh, uh, the spar webs that are there. Uh, the front and the rear spar, you saw that there are spar caps and in between the spar webs. So two examples that we have already seen of such kind of panels uh, and by panel um, it could be with zero curvature and therefore we are essentially dealing with uh, a plate as opposed to a shell because a shell will have certain initial curvature so that is uh, essentially your panel. Okay? So, uh, that is 2D and the dominant load that it takes is neither axial force torque nor bending moment but uh, what are known as shear forces and the shear force in turn could be because of a torque like it is in the shaft but just that the geometry of the shaft is very different from the geometry of the uh, panel so therefore it needs to be dealt with in a uh, very different way. Uh, why in a different way is because all of these things irrespective of which one the, it is you always start with 3D because that is the thing that we are aware of and from 3D we end up with 1D by reducing 2Ds. So two dimensional reduction is required in order to get to the first three uh, which are listed here and the last one which is listed you have to just go from 3D to 2D which means only one level of dimensional reduction is required. right? So because of the number, uh, amount of dimensional reduction being different in the two cases the end results, the theories are also quite different but as I said uh, you cannot uh, use them separately, you have to uh, eventually bridge them because the cover skins 
are attached to all of these other longish elements and therefore you have to deal with all of them simultaneously okay so then uh, we need to model the actual three dimensional structure as i already said either as 1d for the first three cases and as 2d for the last case uh, if that is the case as i already mentioned we need to do a dimensional reduction uh, in the case of the uh, bar column shaft or beam you have to do that uh, to end up with what is known as a generalized curved and twisted beam okay so though in the classic literature only bending is called as beam uh, the element subjected to bending is called as beam the, but we are combining with that because the theory is very similar you don't need to study them separately so you can combine all kinds of longish structures uh, where the cross sectional dimension is small compared to the length all of those uh, irrespective of whether they are facing axial force torque or bending moment and bending moment in both directions you can combine all of them into a single family and study a common theory that uh, we will uh, list out uh, pretty much in towards the middle of this course which is called as the one dimensional generalized curved and twisted beam theory right and as far as the last one is concerned the shear force being handled by the panel uh, which is a two dimensional structure and therefore we deal with just like here it's generalized beam here it is a generalized shell uh, reason why we are saying curved and twisted because uh, there is no specific name for without curved and twisted it's a straight beam we call or a curved beam uh, and this is even in the absence of a load so just like of uh, uh, many doors you would have seen a curved door or a curved frame so essentially uh, even in the absence of a load the very geometry in which it is made it's curved and that's essentially what we are talking about whereas here uh, we know for 2d structures the, there's a specific name when there is no initial curvature we call it a plate uh, or a panel and uh, when there is an initial curvature we call it a shell and therefore we can think of plates or panel as a special case of a shell we don't need to study plates and panels separately if we study shells and put all the initial curvatures and initial twist to zero uh, in the absence of loads then uh, you end up with a plate theory or a panel theory right and further uh, people study membranes separately so essentially if you are uh, in the limit tending the bending stiffnesses to zero you end up with membranes so again there is no need to study that separately you can uh, cover that in shells itself as a special case finally uh, what is the whole idea of doing this uh, you might as well do it with 3D because these days there are commercial software, finite element software like Abacus, ANSYS, Nastron, etc., which can do 3D modeling quite well and quite fast. But in spite of that, the efficiency is much, much more for the uh, case where you have uh, one dimensional or two dimensional model, especially if the accuracy is good enough still. In other words, if you are going from 3D to either 1D or 2D, you will always have a drop in accuracy, you will always have an increase in efficiency, but if the drop in accuracy is negligible, in other words, the drop is such that uh, for all practical purposes, you are getting exactly on top of each other results either from a 3D model or from a 1D model, then you might as well use a 1D model. So that's the whole idea and um, that's something which is possible today in the current state of the art and that increases the efficiency so much that sometimes you can have computational uh, savings in terms of the cpu time of the order of 10 or 100 which uh, might seem not much but essentially you're doing it in one percent of the time glad I did send her off <laughs> yeah so the whole idea is that so uh, you want to increase the efficiency uh, while making sure that the drop in accuracy is low and the reason it is important is that uh, if you are able to do something you are doing in a few minutes in a few seconds it might not seem like much of a saving but in a design kind of a problem or even structural health monitoring real time you would be doing this on an iterative basis many many times so this saving accumulates so just a few minutes saving becomes few hours or few days or uh, essentially you are speeding up your product to the market which means a huge economic advantage uh, 
in terms of a company perspective so from that point of view it's wherever it is possible we want to take advantage of lower dimensional models so i think with this we'll probably stop because people keep coming for various things so we will <laughs> we, we will continue on um, i think online on uh, wednesday right